But this, this might sound random, but I don't, it'll hopefully make sense by the end of it. Have you guys ever wondered why in the Bible they make such a big deal about magic? You guys ever wondered that? Like, think about it, think about it. it usually when you think about a sin in the Bible, like when it says, like, don't kill people, it's really obvious why you're not supposed to kill people. Like, that's really self-evident. When it says, you know, don't steal or don't, you know, hurt other people or don't even, like, even stuff like don't lie. I mean, it's pretty obvious why we're told not to do that stuff. But don't do magic or, as the, 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 the Bible usually says, uh, sorcery, which sounds way more ominous than magic. Like, magic is like the guy you call at the kid's party. Sorcery is like you know, the guy who's conquering Middle Earth, right? So, you know, sorcery, have you guys ever wondered, like, why that's such a big deal in the Bible? Because, you know, look, we we can all talk about magic, and we can all talk about sorcery and realize that, like, there's some good people who do it. Speaking of Middle Earth, Gandalf's a good dude, right? Everybody likes Gandalf. Everybody likes Harry Potter, if you read it, if you give it a chance, right? If you don't, you know, give the book burning thing a try, then you end up liking it, it's fine. All Star Wars is, the Jedi, that's just magic in space. That's all that is. That's it. So like, we could come up with all these examples, and and, and I guess I should just mention too, like all those examples were fictional. Um, the Bible doesn't seem to treat it as like fiction, um, which we can do a lot of things with, we can have a lot of conversations about, but at the very least we should recognize that like, you know, if this is something that most people treat as fiction, well, why are we even talking about it at all, much less talking about it like it's the worst thing ever? Because as it turns out, the Bible does talk about it uh, like universally and sort of from the beginning to the end. If you go all the way back to some of the earliest books in the Bible, some of Ju- the, the Jewish history, you'll see condemnations of sorcery and magic. If you look at people um, who are... Uh, the prophets, you know, the prophets who are telling the people of Israel, um, you know, these are the bad things you're doing and these are the things that are happening because of it. They talk pretty often about sorcery and magic. If you look in the New Testament, the book of Acts, right, really important book. Like we directly one-to-one copy things in the book of Acts. Like you know, baptism and communion and things like that. You know, again, it's like we're literally just looking in the book of Acts and saying, this is what they did, so this is what we'll do. They talk about how, like, magic and sorcery is bad. So it's not, you know, so divorced from, you know, what we think of as, you know, relevant. The Apostle Paul. Again, the Apostle Paul, whose writings are foundational to what we understand about Jesus and the cross and everything else. The Apostle Paul talks about sorcery and magic being bad. And I think that's kind of weird. Like, I think it's, 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 it, to me, it feels like just this random thing uh, to, to care about from, from the beginning of the story of God's people throughout the New Testament. It's just a really, it's in the book of Revelation. Like, the last book talks about, you know, murderers and sorcerers hanging out together. Like, it's, it's just a, such a random thing, uh, in my opinion, at least, um, for magic or sorcery to be there. And I think also it's kind of a confusing thing. Because if we look at the stories of the Bible, sometimes, uh, I mean, I don't want to be blasphemous, but it sure seems like the work of God and the work of sorcerers is basically the same thing. So, so hear me out. Look at like the story of Moses, right? So God calls Moses, burning bush, set my people free, let my people go, all of that, okay? So he sends Moses, and he sends him with a stick. And with that stick, he can do miracles and signs and wonders uh, to prove that Moses is, in fact, from God. That's part of the story. It's right there. Now, I could very easily say, well, it was a magic stick, and he's doing magic tricks. (laughs) But it's not a magic stick because magic's bad, okay? Except the thing about it is, like, he can do certain tricks, you know, like the, you know, turn it into a snake and turn water into blood and stuff. And these Egyptian sorcerers, the bad guys in the story, they can do the same stuff. And, it, you know, and there's nothing in the, in the story that says, oh, it was fake, or oh, you know, it just looked like it. No, the story says that Moses does these miraculous signs, and then the Egyptian sorcerers do the same stuff. And yeah, okay, it says they don't do it as well, fine. But doing the same thing, just not as well, doesn't scream 
lake of fire in the book of Revelation, you know? It doesn't scream the Apostle Paul thousands of years from now will be caring about this. But see, that's, that's, that's not even all. I, I mentioned the book of Acts, that, that there's, there's some talk about magic and, and uh, sorcery and stuff in the book of Acts. Well, there's this guy, and his name is Simon. And Simon is a Samaritan, and that becomes really important. Because in the story we talked about a few weeks ago, Jesus actually tells the Samaritans that they're worshiping the same God that the Jews were. They were just doing it wrong. So it's the same God. It's the same Father in heaven, creator of everything, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever you want to call uh, God, whatever name you want to give for, for God. It's the same God, okay? And so this Samaritan is a sorcerer. He's a magician, and when he does magic, people call him the great one of God. He's Wayne Gretzky of God. So he's the great one of God. But remember, this is not the great one of strange God that is different than the God of Israel or the God that's of the Bible. It's the great one of the same God. And see, it even gets weirder because this magician ends up seeing a guy named Philip who is performing miracles, and he says, that guy's doing the same stuff I'm doing. He just does it way better. <laughs> like, I'm not even good at this. Like, compared to what that guy's doing, I am terrible at this magic thing. And so he ends up following Philip. He ends up becoming a Christian, getting baptized, doing all that. And yeah, okay, so he's not awesome. Like, the story is a bad story. He's not a good Christian at all. But, you know, he's a Christian, and he does, you know, what he, you know, he does all this stuff. The point is, what he calls magic and what Philip calls a miracle are close enough to the same thing that not only does uh, Simon see it as functionally the same, but the other people who have called Simon the great one of God also see it as functionally the same. And so the question in my head, and, and I, for years I've wondered this, for years. I, I don't know what other people think about in their spare time, but for years I've looked at this and I've thought, like, what is going on with, like, why is it such a big deal at all? But even if it is a big deal, like, why does it look this, sort of the same? Like, what is going on with magic? And you might think that has nothing to do with your faith. But I assure you, it totally does. In fact, the answer to the question I just asked, what's the big deal with magic, is actually a fundamental foundational idea of who you are as a Christian. Me too, everybody. It's an incredibly important thing for us to consider. And I'm going to answer it, but I need some help to get there. And so to get to the answer to the question about the magic, we need to talk about the birds in my backyard. Post about this on Facebook. Some of you guys already know. I got a new obsession this last year. Look, we all had extra time, all right? We all had time. And we all, you know, sort of adopted new hobbies and, um, you know, try to figure. So, so Stephanie, had, she'd wanted birds for a while in the backyard. Not like birds in the house. That's weird. But, you know, she wanted, unless you have birds in your house, in which I didn't mean weird. but it is the first thing that came to mind. Anyway, so, look, look. She wanted to put up bird feeders. She wanted to be able to see the birds in the backyard. And I, look, I, I full disclosure, I didn't care. I mean, that's the sort of thing. She's like, hey, what do you think about bird feeders in the backyard? And I'm like, I don't know why you're asking that, because I don't care at all. Like, what does it, what does it matter? It's a thing in the backyard. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to see it. So we got a few birds in the backyard. Okay, whatever. Who cares? So that was my attitude at first, was who cares, whatever, do what you want. Why are we having this talk? Uh, let's watch TV. And, and, and that's not what ended up happening, because one day this thing happened. So Stephanie ended up putting, I think we, do we start with two, Stephanie? Start with two? We have like nine now, but like we had to start with these two bird feeders. It's, it's, we, it's gotten weird, it has, but at least they're outside. So we, got, we started with these two bird feeders, right? And we put the food in the bird feeder, and uh, I just, again, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. And then one day, I just happen to look outside and I see something that I, you know, unironically was absolutely beautiful. My, I, this is an apple tree in my backyard and it, it makes these like rancid apples. We should probably get rid of that tree, but we got this apple tree, rancid apples. And so usually I don't like this tree, but um, this tree is covered in gold and black. Like just like the brightest 
the brightest gold and like the darkest black and just like colors that are hard to replicate for human beings. I look outside and, and, and no joke, they're, they're, you know, I look closer. I have hundreds of goldfinches in my tree. And it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Like they're just, it's covered, covering this tree. And, and it was like, it was crazy. Cause like, it's like they were taking turns. Like they, you know, they, there was like hundreds of them. And then they would they'd take like six or eight of them would fly down and eat some food for a little bit. And then they'd fly away. And it was like a line, like, you know, like and like six or eight would come in and, and much better behaved than humans. And there's just this, this line, this conveyor belt, this line of these, these finches. And so I would, I would be able to get real, you know, when I was real close because I guess I should mention, like, so we have the, the window, and they're just right outside the window. So, like, I can always just see, you know, real close what's in the feeder. And so, uh, I mean, you just see, like, really up close. And for the first time in my life, and this is going to sound weird, and it is, I don't care. But, like, for the first time, I actually had, like, looked at a bird. Like, I knew what a bird looked like. I knew what birds did. But I had never in my life seen how, like, their heads moved. The, it's like Jurassic Park, actually. That's how. Which is more the Jurassic Park moved like birds. But... Regardless, like they've got like the crazy head movement, and like when they eat, it's real weird. And like, like the grace, and like they're able to like land on like a spot. You know, they can they can go from you know across the 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 entire yard and just land exactly where they want to. And like, but then also like I don't even looked like it is a violent thing to see them take off again. So there's like grace and beauty and like strength and like, you know, violence. And it's just all in this tiny little package. And I'm just looking at these, these, these goldfinches and just, it's just amazing. And I'm like, Stephanie, come, come look at this. She's like, yeah, it's a bird. Like, right, but if you ever looked at a bird, she's like, yeah, that's why I wanted the things in the backyard. What are you doing? It's a whole thing. The whole thing. She was very frustrated with me. She should have been because I didn't understand. But I understood. That day, I understood. And for the next several months, all I did, I mean, not all I did, but a lot of what I did was stare out my window and look at these, these birds. Because it's not just goldfinches, obviously. Like, if you've looked around at birds, there's all sorts of different kinds of birds. Like, there's these little chickadees. Like, I love the little chickadees because they're black and white. And, like, they're really shy. And they're, they, like, they don't want to be around other birds at all. But they always manage to eat. Like, they, they get in and out. And it's like, they're like spies. Like, they sneak up. And it's, it's really cool. And, and then are these, these doves, in my, I think they're called morning doves in my backyard. And there's always two of them. And, and it's, it's cool because they're like, they're massive, like way bigger than the other, the other birds. But they're really like dainty somehow. Like they're really like, they're massive, but they're able to fit in spaces that you wouldn't think that birds would be able to do. But they also like, they kind of just walk around on their legs on the ground, which I didn't, man, I didn't think birds did that kind of stuff. Uh, that was weird. Listen, I learned, did you guys know that cardinals are not just red? I didn't know that. I had no idea. This was brand new information. I'm 36 years old. I'm like, what is that bird? Oh, it's a cardinal. It's a lady cardinal. The male cardinals are red. The ladies are like brown or something. But like, it's, it's a cool, it's like multicolored. Like they do all this stuff. Like we have like multiple kinds of woodpeckers that for some reason were not attacking trees. I thought, I mean, Woody Woodpecker wildly gave me, you know, the wrong expectations for how woodpeckers act. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, just all sorts of stuff. But then there was my favorite. There's my favorite. There's this like fat, dumpy little bird that doesn't look like it should be able to fly. And when I saw that, I was like, well, that's my favorite. That guy's awesome. Um, because it seems like he's breaking the laws of physics, or she. I don't, I don't, I don't want to misgender the, the bird. But you know, like, I, whatever the bird is. And, and so then, you know, I, I, at this point, I had a bird book because I'm the guy with a bird book now. I'm, a, I'm lying. I shouldn't lie in a sermon. I'm the guy with like five bu bird books now. At the time, I had a bird book, but like I looked at the bird, and it's called, and I'm not making this up, it's called the tufted titmouse. <laughs> this thing is so goofy that a scientist, a man or woman of learning, looked at that and said, yeah, let's call that the titmouse. Got to. Just have to do it. And I love those little things because they don't look like they should be able to fly, but they can. So I'm just having the best time. Uh, and I, honestly, I think no, like, I mean, obviously, like, it's hard to be sincere sometimes about stupid things like birds. But um, I mean, they're just beautiful. And I just absolutely fell in love. 
and it was great, and I'm posting on Facebook about it, and I'm seeing all the different birds. And then one day, the war began. The war began. So here's the thing. I'm very shallow, as it turns out. I'm a very shallow guy. And there was this bird in my yard that I hadn't really noticed had shown up. And I didn't really know what that bird was going to do. And one day, I heard like this horrible sound from this, this, uh, this bird, and it was a robin who was very, she was just in distress because she had set up her, her nest up on my gutter. And we knew that, and we were very excited to see the baby birds. Um, and that nest had been knocked over, and the eggs had been shattered on the ground, and this robin was very angry about it. And right there was, it sort of looked like a crow, but its head was blue, and it's called a grackle. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a grackle, but they're ugly, and that's why I didn't pay any attention to them, because I'm very shallow. And I said, well, that's an ugly bird, I don't care. As it turns out, grackles are invasive. As it also turns out, they are territorial, and they get rid of the other birds. And I didn't realize that's what was happening until it was too late. I hadn't noticed when it was one or two grackles, and I didn't notice when it was three or four. I didn't notice it was like six or eight grackles. I didn't notice until one day when all I have is nothing but grackles in the yard. And we're like, well, what do we do now? Like, we just have crows. Now our backyard is just like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. That is not, that was not, was not the plan. Like, our backyard was the pride lands after Mufasa dies. <laughs> and Scar takes over. We didn't know what to do. We had no idea what to do. Turns out we didn't need to do anything because there's a hero to this story. There's a hero. So we'd always had blue jays in our backyard. We always had one or two blue jays, at least. Always. Always one or two blue jays. And uh, as it turns out, those guys were scouts. And blue jays, if there's anything in this world a blue jay hates more than a grackle, it's nothing. They hate grackles more than anything. What I'm about to tell you in no way is exaggerated. Stephanie can back me up that this really happened. It was a Wednesday in July, and we had been talking about what do we do about all these crackles. And then we hear the loudest screeching noise from an army of blue jays. We tried to count them. It was like 75 blue jays in my backyard and like 75 grackles. And the blue jays had the high ground. They started with the high ground. They were in the trees. And the grackles were around the food and the feeders and on my house and everything else. And they are just screeching at each other. And we have no idea what to do. All I know is poor little Chara, our seven pound dog. God rest her soul. She's looking and she's like, I'm never going outside again. <laughs> this is where I go to the bathroom from now on is in here. Just be prepared. I'm not doing that. And Stephanie is like supposed to be doing work, and she's like, no, we're, walk we're watching at the windows. This is what we have to do. We have to see how this plays out. And I got to tell you guys, I'm not kidding when I say it was a war. I don't, it was like watching like Braveheart, like the two sides, like the Blue Jays in the trees, the grackles like everywhere else, and it was, one of them made a move, and they just... I mean, just flew into each other. It was like it was hailing outside. Like just birds just hitting the walls and the windows and the roof. It was, it was, I mean, it was scaring everyone in the house. It was just crazy. And this went on till like Friday. Like they would have a big battle screeching, attacking, and then they'd retreat to each other's sides. And then big battle screeching, attacking, and you know, retreat to each other's sides. And I had no idea what was going to happen. All I knew is this was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I had no idea that Blue Jays felt this way. I just had no idea. And about Friday, the Blue Jays, the, the, the tide turned, and the Blue Jays won. And the crackles went away. And by Saturday morning, all the other birds came back because the crackles were gone. It was like when Simba becomes the king on Pride Rock, and everybody is welcome. And none of that is exaggerated. None of, like, I, I don't, like, I, scientists may say, like, that, that can't happen, but they named my favorite bird the titmouse. So pretty sure they've lost credibility when it comes to birds. Promise it happens. Where am I going with this? 
So birds are amazing. And maybe you don't like birds. Maybe you're sitting there and like, Drew, they're just flying rats. That's what I thought. I know. I, I know. In fact, by the way, let me, I don't have time in this. I've already taken up too much time on the bird thing. Let me tell you about the European starling one of these days. It is literally like, what, what is the group that like, there's like, a, there's like a group that has said like they're basically flying rats. And they're also invasive. And some guy, listen, I got to say this. Some guy in the 19 teens decided every bird that Shakespeare had written about uh, needed to be in America. So he went to Europe and brought these flying rats over to New York and just let them go. And was like, well, my job is done. Now we've got those guys. Anyway, again, where was I going? So birds are amazing. And if you're thinking like, man, Drew, stop talking about birds. No, because listen, birds are amazing. <laughs> and also, Jesus talked about birds. That's where this is going. Love birds, hate birds, never thought about them before now. You know, whatever, that's fine. But birds are theologically important. Jesus made one of his most vitally important points one day about birds, which tells me Jesus sat around, watched birds, and thought a lot about them. And then one day he said this, Gospel according to Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, most important sermon in the Bible. Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough food, clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food? Your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Jesus wanted us to look at the birds. Jesus wanted us to look at these creatures and think through who and what they are. Now, there's, there's several points we can come up with. This. I mean, there's sort of the immediate point. Jesus talks about the money thing. You know, he's, look, if you're going to be, if you're going to look at, you know, your 401k, if you're going to be enslaved to your, your bank account, if everything you do revolves around money in your life, you're not serving God. It's just the way it is. Okay, that is the initial, the initial, uh, you know, immediate application, okay? And then he talks about not worrying. He's like, look, you're not, like, worrying doesn't do any good. There's no reason to worry. It doesn't help anything. You can't add a single moment to your life. Don't worry. You know, consider the birds. The birds don't have 401ks. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have money. Um, and God takes care of them just fine. So, so you should, if you're a person who is trusting in God, you should be a person who understand, understands that God's provision uh, is for those who plan well and also don't. Because <laughs> birds don't plan. They don't harvest. They don't uh, plant. They don't have barns. All of that. Okay. You see, here's a thing as I'm thinking about this bird thing. I got it, those two points, great. If we wanna walk away with those two points as the sermon, wonderful, that's great, perfect. But you see, there's something for me that I think we have lost that maybe was an obvious point to Jesus' audience that has become less obvious over the last couple of thousand years as we Christians have been Christians. And that point is this, God cares about birds. God doesn't just care about birds. According to Jesus, God feeds birds. Which, by the way, means that when Stephanie said, uh, do you want to put some bird feeders in our backyard? What she was actually saying is, do you want to do the holy sacred work of God? But God feeds the birds. God cares about the birds. And here's the deal. If you thought my bird story was stupid because you don't like birds, perfect. It's for you then. God cares about the thing you don't care about. Maybe they are dirty flying rats. Maybe I'm making too much of them. Well, God cares enough about them to feed them. You see, here's the thing, guys. The very first story in the Bible is God making the whole world. I mean, we always jump to the 27th verse of this, when God makes man in his own image. We're very proud of that. You know, the first 26 verses have nothing to do with us. In fact, 
The Bible tells us uh, in the story over and over that when God make, made stuff that wasn't us, God made, you know, oceans and, and, and forests and plants and animals and, you know, the sun and the day. I mean, God made all the stuff that's not us. Over and over, God said, it's good. Which is to say this. The world without people is good. And the world without people has lots of stuff for God to do. He's out here feeding birds. <laughs> See, we always put ourselves at the center of everything. And when Jesus says, think of the birds, we are forced to recognize that God has a lot of stuff going on that has nothing to do with us. Of course, not just birds. I mean, I don't even know that God likes birds that much. I mean, he says God likes people way more. <laughs> but God has a lot of stuff going on that has nothing to do with people. Creation is not about us. The world does not revolve around you or me. The gospel, the nature of God, the kingdom of God, it does not revolve around you or me. Here's something. If human beings didn't exist, God is still love. God isn't changed by us existing or not existing. The Bible tells that God is love. That is not just something that has to do with us. God is objectively love. That's what God is. That's who God is. God in his nature is not changed by our existence or our lack of existence, which means faith has never, was never supposed to be about us getting God on our side because everything here is about us. Faith has always been about God's already doing stuff. And as people who love and hope in and trust in God, we're looking for where God is working and we're getting on board with him. And that brings us back to Gandalf. It brings us back to magic and sorcery. You know what the problem with magic and sorcery is? It's all about the magician and the sorcerer. It's all about, it's all about that. If you're a bad magician, your spell doesn't work. If you don't know the magic words, nothing happens. If you're a sorcerer who does it wrong, the intended outcome never happens. Magic and sorcery is about a person attempting to influence God or spirits or the gods or whatever, depending on where you are in history. A person trying to influence God to do what they want God to do. That's magic. I'm going to say it again because it's important. Magic, sorcery, is a person trying to get God to do what they want God to do. Faith, what we're supposed to be, is us saying, God, we want to do what you want us to do. In faith, God is at the center. In magic, people are at the center. And see, now I'm stepping in it. Now this lighthearted little sermon about birds is sort of stepping on our toes. Because I've seen a lot of magical Christians in my life. I see a lot of magical Christians in my life. A lot of people who think that the purpose of prayer is to get God to do what they want. Well, why wouldn't you want this, God? <laughs> Here's my prayer, God. I want you to do this and this and this. Th that's prayer. Why wouldn't God what we want, want what we want? We're right, right? A lot of magical Christians when it comes to worship. We will worship God when we like the way it is, when it makes us feel good, when it's what we think it should be like. That's when we worship God. We'll serve God, you know, for the people we like. <laughs> we'll include this group of people over here because we like those guys. Those guys are great. These people, mm, mm -mm. these people we like. I dare say I've spent the vast majority of my life in the church 
watching Christians be really bad sorcerers. <laughs> like they're trying so hard to get God to do what they want. God, why, why won't you get, the world is not what it should, we don't think the world's what it should be, so God, we, we need you to fix it like this. <laughs> God, my life's not what I think it should be, we need you to fix it like this. Guys, that's magic. That's sorcery, and that's why the Apostle Paul cared. Because he understood that magic puts us at the center, influencing God. In faith, in faith, we're saying, okay, God, look, we don't have the answers. We don't know the whys. We, like, I've never even looked at a bird before, God. <laughs> so, so what are you doing? Where are you working? What is it that you want of my life? That's faith. And we can only be at that place. Guys, look, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not ranting at anybody that doesn't include myself. Like, I love being a, mag a magic Christian, too. Like, I love it. I love praying and telling God what to do and then being like, oh, yeah, well, you know, just rubber stamp what this prayer is. Because <laughs> I've already got the answer. I just need you, like, to sign this paper, and then we'll go get it done. Like, God is essentially the boss that, you know, isn't paying attention in, in my prayers a lot. I mean, we all do this, right? But I, we bring this up because when Jesus said consider the birds, what he was trying to get us to understand is that God is up to so much more than we think he is. God cares about birds. The passage goes on to talk about flowers. I mean, like, like God cares about things that are temporary and tiny and small and insignificant that nobody cares about. But God does. Because God, in his plan, in his work, what he's doing is so much bigger than what we want him to do. I dare say we would not have done virtually anything that Jesus did. Uh, we would do, done, we did not, would not have tried to save humanity that way. We would not have tried, like, there's just so many things that when we look at what God does and who God is, we, we don't, we're not that way. We don't love everybody. We don't care for everybody. There's so many things that we don't do that God does because God is bigger than us. God has things going on that have nothing to do with us. The world was good without us. We are simply participants in God's good creation, trying to help out. He's invited us to do that. In that very first story, he doesn't say, okay, Adam and Eve, well, now it's your show. No, he says, look, help. I made you to help. And yeah, I'm going to give you a lot, of, a lot of responsibility, but that only works when you're faithful. And then, of course, we know that how that story ends, when they were faithful. As Christians, it's not our job to tell God what to do. It's not our job to try to get God to do what we want, think that God should be doing. It's our job in humility and in faith to seek out where God is working and say, where can I be of help? And Jesus said, look at the birds, because the fact of the matter is this. Jesus spent a lot of time looking at nature stuff. We're beginning a, a, a brand new series this morning. Uh, for the next couple of months, we're going to be talking about Christ in creation. It's a cliche for a reason. People say, well, I feel closer to God out in nature. Yeah, you should, actually, because God made all that stuff. <laughs> and God communicates to us through all that stuff. And Jesus constantly looked at nature stuff and was like, man, that tells me something about God. Or man, that tells me something about people. Or man, that tells me something about the kingdom. Or man, that tells me something about, about the, the gospel. Jesus was constantly outside experiencing what God has made, saying, this teaches me something. And I know I look outside, and nobody wants to go outside. So it's probably a good time of year <laughs> for us just to look and say, okay, well, what did Jesus have to say? We're going to be doing that for the next couple of months this morning. We talk about Jesus talking about birds. And we learn a valuable lesson that's actually about magic. It's actually about our faith. It's actually about who we are as people who believe in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, trusting in God. Our first lesson from Christ in creation is this. 
life in this world is not about us. Everything is about God, and we are called to join him in his work. Life in this world is not about us. Everything is about God, and we are called to join him in his work. The musicians are going to come forward. We're going to sing a song. We offer this invitation to take God up on this offer. This is in no way. I was trying to get God to, you know, change his mind about us or whatever. Like, guys, becoming a Christian is all about us changing. God has always loved us. God has always invited us. God has always, uh, he's always saved us. I mean, we, we, God saved us 2,000 years ago. I was born 36 years ago. It's always, it's always been there, okay? What, what we're called to do is simply change our hearts and our minds. Not trying to change God, instead allowing ourselves to be changed by God to be the people he wants. If you haven't made that decision, uh, we've got a nice warm baptistry. All sorts of people can do it. Uh, let's talk. If you're already a birth believer in Christ, you're looking for a perfect church home, this place is not it. We do serve a perfect God, and we want to connect, call, and cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. And we want to be people who don't uh, try sorcery and magic. We want to be people who don't tell God what to do, but instead we want to be people who go to God seeking his will, saying, where can we be of service? Because we trust God's vision for the world is so much greater than ours or anybody else's. As we stand...